Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of our Train Route Building tutorial series. In this series I'm using TRS-19, but most things also apply to other trains versions. In this video I'm covering the basics of signals and how they work in trains, and also some other trackside objects like junction levers, speed signs and track markers. I will not be covering interlocking towers, track circuits or individual aspects of different signalling systems from around the world, as those things would be beyond the scope of this video. So, let's begin by loading our route. The first thing to understand about signals is that they work in what's called signal blocks. A signal block is the piece of track from one signal to the next. If a train is in this signal block, or if the signal block is open, so if the track just ends without a signal or buffers at the end, or if a junction is switched against the signal, then the signal will display a danger aspect. Let's demonstrate this. Okay, now I've placed down some track and some signals. I've placed two signals here, one protecting this track going into the junction, another protecting this track going into the junction, and a third protecting this track going into the junction. Now if this was an actual route, you wouldn't want to place the signals this way, and I'll get to that a bit later. But for the purposes of this demonstration, this works. For the signals to work properly, you need to have a train on the tracks. So I'll just add a locomotive. Okay, now we have a locomotive facing our signal and the junction is switched in the direction that we want, but the signal is still displaying a danger aspect, in this case indicated by a red light. This is because this signal's signal block, which is the length of track that extends behind the signal all the way to the next signal, doesn't find a next signal. The signal block is open, like I mentioned before, because the track just ends. So, if we place another signal here, facing the same direction, and then we go back, you can see this signal is now displaying a yellow light, or in this case, an approach aspect. This means that this signal's signal block is clear, so the distance between this signal and the next is clear, but the signal block after that is not. Now, if we added another signal, so one just about here, you can see that this signal has now turned green, because this signal's signal block, so the distance to the next signal, is clear, and the next signal block is clear as well. Now, if I switch this junction by going to the Junction Direction tool and then clicking on the junction, you can see that the signal immediately turns red. This is because this signal's signal block is now open. The signal searches for the next signal, it goes along with the track, and then it comes across this junction which is set against the signal, which means that the signal block is ended here, and it hasn't found another signal, which means it's open, and so it's displaying the red aspect. Now, if I switch this junction back, you can see that the light has gone green again, it's displaying the clear aspect, but if I add another piece of rolling stock, for example this caboose, in this signal signal block, so for example here, you can see that this signal is now displaying the danger aspect, or a red light, because this signal signal block is no longer clear. And it works the same if I instead place this caboose in the next signal block, so over here, you can see that this signal is now displaying the yellow light, which is the approach aspect, meaning that this block is clear but the next one isn't. So now let's get back to what I said before, which is that this placement of signals isn't very good. This is because trains can block each other. So to demonstrate this, I'll place some locos. So if there is a train coming from over here wanting to go along this way, but there is another train wanting to go the opposite way along the same piece of track, both these trains could go up to the signal which is displaying a danger aspect, meaning they could go up to the signal block in which the other train is located. This obviously causes both trains to block each other. This one can't continue because he's got a red light, because the other train is in the signal block, and this one can't continue because he's got a red light, because the other train is in the signal block. 
This is why placing signals going in both directions on a single piece of track is not a good idea. Now you can do this if you're using the interlocking tower system, which is a bit complicated and involves session rules, which I won't go into in this video. Or if you're making the sessions yourself, you could manually set the signals to display a particular aspect and have it work that way. But that means that one, it's a lot of work for you, and two, it means that if someone else wants to make their own session on your route or just drive around trains with other trains on the tracks, that trains can become stuck. Because of this, when I make a route, I usually just make sure that I place signals in such a way that trains cannot block each other. So let's go back to the example we have here and just change a few things to make it work better. Okay, now I've placed the same junction, only with some passing loops. Now if this was an actual route, and you had these passing loops so close together, you'd probably just double track the entire junction. This example represents a single track main line, where these passing loops are probably a few miles apart. But for this example I've put them close together so it's easier to see what's going on. So now let's place some signals. In the example from before, I've placed the signals right before the junction on the single track. However, in the new example, I'm going to place the signals where the passing loops end. So, around here. Now I've placed the signals protecting the junction in such a way the trains are no longer able to block each other. So, let's place the locomotives like in the example from before. So, if there's a train coming this way, and there's a train coming this way, and they both want to go straight across this junction, then one of these trains will be stopped at a red signal, but the other train can just continue on, I'm just going to move the locomotive, can just continue along the track, and then use the passing loop to pass the other train safely, and then with the train passed, this one can continue along the single track main line. And that's the core concept you need to understand when placing signals. Yes, there are some intricate things you can do with interlocking towers, but everything depends on understanding signal blocks and avoiding trains being able to block each other. With that being said, I would like to cover two more things concerning signals. One is that if you have two tracks that are crossing each other, so for example over here where these diamonds are, then these tracks will not be protected by signals. So if I place, for example, a signal over here and one over here, then in reality these two signals would be protecting the diamond, so that two trains wouldn't be able to collide. But in trains, the crossing tracks aren't actually connected. They're just overlaid over top of each other, which means that the signals don't know that the other track exists, and so they won't protect the diamond. But that's not as bad as it sounds, because in trains, trains only have collision physics if they're on the same piece of track. So to demonstrate this, I'm just going to add another locomotive on this track, going over the diamond, and then I'm going to add another locomotive on the other track, and as you can see, I can move these locomotives straight through each other. The second thing about signals that I want to cover are two-track main lines. So, if you have a two-track main line, so you've got one track going this way, you've got another track beside it, then what you can do is have these be one way. So, if trains are driving on the right-hand side, like in America for example, then what you can do is you can place signals on the right track going one way in this direction, and then you can place signals on the other track going the other way. This way, trains are only going to be able to go one way and thus will not be able to block each other. So now let's go over to junction levers or levers, depending on where you are. If I zoom into these junctions that we've made, you can see that a junction lever asset has already been placed. This is the default junction lever asset which, if you're just making a route for the fun of it and you're not too concerned about period or location accurateness, then this is fine. 
But if you're making a route that's set in a specific location or a specific time, then you should consider replacing these levers with levers that are more appropriate. So for example, let's imagine that this junction is set in the USA in kind of the 50s or 60s, where you would have junction levers with stands. So I'll just delete this junction lever object, and then I've got a junction lever in a pick list that is more accurate. In this case, I'm going to be using the CNR switch stand main one. I've selected this asset, and now I'm going to place it where the junction lever should be, which is where the tracks meet. As you can see, this lever or lever looks very different to the other one, and this does add a lot of realism to your route if that's what you're going for. So now let's quickly touch on speedboards before moving on to track marks. In trains, the default speed limit is 40 miles an hour. So if you load a session, any train will automatically have that speed limit. If you want to change that speed limit, the train must move past a speedboard. So for example, in my pick list I've got a speedboard named speedb 10 mph Now if I place this asset, for example here, and I turn it the right way, you can see the speedboard says 10, meaning 10 miles per hour, and now if any train moves along this piece of track past this speedboard in the direction that the speedboard is pointing, that train's speed limit will be set to whatever the speedboard is saying. Now let's just quickly go over track marks. So if you go over to the track mark mode, you can see there is a short list of assets here. The first is track marker. If you place this on a piece of track, you can give it a name, for example, mark one. And what this does is it adds a point that you can send AI trains to. So for example, if I wanted an AI train to come up to the siding and stop here at this side, then I would place a track mark over here and tell the train to go to this track mark. Note that track marks are invisible when you're driving on a session. The next track mark is the trigger track mark. You can place this on a piece of track and what this does is it detects trains going over it. You can use this in conjunction with session rules to make things happen at certain situations. The next trigger is the track direction marker. What this does is it basically makes signals one way. The next track marker is the track priority marker. What this does is it sets the priority of a piece of track. So if you place it, you can set the track priority here. What this does is that trains will favor going along this piece of track if they have the same priority. If they don't, they would rather choose a different track if one is available. The next track mark is the invisible track bump. If you place this, then you can select the pitch and roll angles in degrees that any rolling stock going over this will tilt. The last two track marks are the track circuit detector and track circuit insulator. These have to do with interlocking towers and interlocking signals, and I will not be covering these in this tutorial. The last thing I'll be covering is the advanced tab. So if you click at the bottom of this panel and open up the advanced tab, you can see that there are only three tools here. These are the get trigger radius tool, the set trigger radius tool, and the adjust trigger radius tool. With the adjust trigger radius tool selected, I can click and hold on the trigger, and you can see that the radius in which the trigger will trigger when a train goes over is changing. And that covers everything I wanted to cover in this video. So thank you for watching. I hope it was helpful.